Welcome, everyone. My name is Tom Daschle, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you here today. This is a special day for many of us. Uh, it was now 11 years ago that Jason Grimay came to four former majority leaders with an idea. And the idea was to create a venue for bipartisanship, an opportunity for people on either side of the political aisle to convene to talk about common ground, not to give up our political identity, not to in any way disown what it is we came to fight for, but really just to find a way to maintain a dialogue, a communication, and hopefully in so doing, compromise that would lead to positive movement on good public policy. I have long felt that compromise is really the oxygen of democracy, that without compromise, democracy is, if not impossible, very, very difficult. And so for the last 11 years, we've attempted to do just that. And one of those people who, whose vision, whose commitment, whose dedication to bipartisanship, to leadership, to commitment to public service is with us today. He's been somebody many of us have admired for a long, long time. If there's one thing that I hope we can all encourage, it's public service in one form or another. And I would argue that George Mitchell is the epitome of public service. Going all the way back to days working with Senator Muskie of Maine, but as a federal judge, as a United States Senator, as one of the most effective majority leaders our country has known, as a negotiator, a diplomat, someone committed to working with people on the other side. Bob Dole can't be here today, but I've heard Bob talk many, many times about the enormous respect he had for George Mitchell. Why? In large measure because they treated each other with the civility, the decency, and the respect that each deserved. So we celebrate that commitment to public service. We celebrate the recognition of the importance of good bipartisan work here at the center. And we, so, and we, we do so today especially as we launch the inaugural Bob Dole series uh, around uh, good, strong leadership with somebody who could do it no better than our friend George Mitchell. So, let me add my welcomes to you all. I'm going to say a few more words about this leadership series. Um, you know, there's an active debate in the literature about whether leaders are made through experience, this is kind of the Vince Lombardi idea, or whether they just come into the world with these kinds of innate characteristics. This has the somewhat sexist title, the great man theory. Um, and as we looked around what was happening in Washington, our view was, we'll take all of them. We don't really actually uh, think that that's a debate that requires resolution, because the need to have people from national local politics, business world, advocacy community, who can help us think through what are the kind of causes, the characteristics, and the circumstances that enables some people to draw diverse views into shared solutions. Um, that's something that we really obviously care a lot about. As Tom mentioned, we're very proud to um, name this series actually in honor of both Bob and Elizabeth Dole. Um, they both have had remarkable careers. They've overcome each significant diversity. They both had the um, confidence and the creativity to actually dignify differences to seek that kind of constructive collision with people with whom they disagreed. And what I think made um, Senator Dole in particular unique was he also then inspired other people to want to do the same. And so we are really um, proud on his 95th birthday to have announced the series. We also had a large number of people on uh, the phone singing him happy birthday, which um, the Washington Post described as lovely, but suggested we all stick to our day jobs. It was a rather cacophonous. We all started at different times. It was absolutely, we have a tape of it. It's really quite horrible. Um, but so just talking a little more about where we're going, you know, I think the point, obviously, is to learn from past success, um, also from past failure. 
but our goal is very much anchored in the future. Um, I think there is a seduction to you know, long for gentler times. That is not the BPC's imagination of how you make real change. I often think of a poet named Susan Stewart who described nostalgia as a disease that pines for a time that never existed. Our nation has always been the story of rising above political strife. And that's obviously what we believe is necessary today. I think we can't help but acknowledge that some of the strains in whatever the fabric of our democracy are looking like real tears these days. Um, but we are an optimistic cast here at the BPC, and that is why it's really fantastic to have um, Senator Mitchell kick off this series. I think of you as the greatest diplomat of your generation. And uh, my hope is to ask you some questions about some of the intractable conflicts that you have been in the middle of, um, and then also probe a little bit some of your more fundamental insights about what leadership means to you. Um, but maybe just to ask you to start with just kind of setting the stage a little bit for the discussion, and then I'll interrogate you. Well, well, well first, of course, uh, it's uh, thank you for your comments. Thank Tom for your generous comments. Uh, it's really an honor for me to participate in a program in honor of Bob and Liddy Dole. Uh, I enter the Senate uh, by appointment. Uh, fortunately, I didn't know the history of appointed senators until after I took office, because it happened so suddenly and unexpectedly. I was very depressed when I read that appointed senators have had a very low success rate in remaining in the Senate. Uh, so I was in awe of Bob Doe when I first met him. Uh, it was in, uh, in the early 1980s. He was the chairman of the Finance Committee. I was number 100 in the Senate, having been appointed and somewhat insecure in my position. Uh, but over time, uh, I watched and observed and came to admire greatly uh, the way he handled himself in the Senate. So when just a few years later I was fortunate enough to be elected Senate Majority Leader, I made it a point that my first meeting would be with Bob Dole. And uh, I told him that uh, uh, he'd been there for, I think it was then 28 years in the Congress, and I'd only been a few years. He knew more about the Congress than I would ever know, but I had been there long enough to know that if the leaders in the Senate the majority and the minority leaders didn't trust each other, what was an already difficult task would become impossible. And so we discussed and agreed upon a pretty fundamental set of principles of candor, openness. We promised to keep our word to each other, not to try to embarrass each other. And uh, he and I are both proud to say that since then, and that's many years ago, not once ever has a harsh word passed between us in public or in private. We disagreed every day on most of the issues that came before us. Uh, we negotiated procedure, as Tom and the other senators present know. The Senate is a very difficult and unruly institution, and uh, just handling the procedure part of it is extraordinarily time consuming. And uh, so Bob and I every day had long discussions on how we would proceed in the Senate. And we had uh, many disagreements on uh, major legislation. But since we had a trust between us and an open line of communication, we were able to negotiate the enactment of much important legislation in the time that we, in the six years that we served together in those positions. And when we didn't agree, we left it to the Senate to decide, and we made certain in making our arguments to the Senate that we concentrated on the issues at hand and were not personal in any way. And so we have become very good friends, dear friends, uh, and uh, I hope to see him on, soon on a visit here. Uh, and he and Liddy, of course, have both had distinguished public careers. Uh, in the Senate and in a whole variety of uh, public service areas. And to this day, Bob, who just recently celebrated his 95th birthday, continues to uh, greet veterans at the Veterans Memorial, to work actively in connection with the Eisenhower uh, Commission and a number of other 
activities and still to some extent practices law. So it's, uh, for me, you couldn't have a better example of leadership. And I'll conclude on a personal note. I s was proud to have served in the United States Army. Uh, I feel there I became an adult, learned the importance of patriotism, of teamwork. I learned that the mission is more important than the man and that how you had always to protect those with whom you shared responsibility. Bob served in combat and in the most dangerous and difficult of circumstances, acquitted himself very well, grievously wounded uh, shortly after he got to Italy in the brutal conflict that took place in Italy after the Allied forces uh, invaded Italy and moved up the peninsula. By an incredible coincidence, uh, Danny Inouye, who most of the other senators here will know and many of you will know of, uh, was in Italy at the same time nearby. They didn't know each other. They were different units, but they both were very seriously injured. Danny lost his arm. Bob lost the use of an arm. And they recuperated together in uh, a military hospital. And Danny later told me the story. I'd never actually checked it with Bob, is that when in this long recuperation they, they talked often and they both said that they wanted to go back home and get established and then run for Congress. Uh, Danny naturally expected Bob to be there first, but Danny got elected, got here, and Bob wasn't here, so he said he called him up and said, well, I'm here, where are you? <laughs> I guess that must have spurred Bob on to activity in the uh, Bob got elected and joined him, and, and they remained close friends throughout their careers, and they were both friends and mentors to me and uh, many others here. So I think it's a tremendous thing you're doing, Jason, here, and I'm, I'm very pleased to take part of it, and I, I hope that uh, uh, you'll be able to get Bob up here sometime, uh, because he, he remains a font of uh, uh, interest, humor, uh, and uh, a, a good, great spirit of leadership. So as we start to think about leadership, I'm going to start probably what most of imagine is the obvious place, and that is the Good Friday Accord that you played such a critical role in to resolve the conflict in Northern Ireland. And if I can ask you to go all the way back, and I've never asked you this before, what were you thinking when Bill Clinton said, Senator, I'd like you to come in and help fix this problem. I mean, you know, do you have a memory of what that first conversation oh, felt I very, like? Oh, I have very good memory of it. Uh, in, in March of 1994, I decided to uh, not seek re-election. And I wanted to tell the president, but I, I knew that he would try to persuade me to change my mind and to run. So what I did was uh, uh, we had a dinner on the evening before I was going to publicly make my announcement. But I sent the video announcing it to every television station in Maine before I went to the White House. <laughs> so when he started making his argument, I said, there's no point in you talking any further, I said, because I've already sent the videos out. And even if you persuaded me, I can't change my mind. The television stations have all got my announcement. So we had a long conversation. We spent a couple of hours together. And he, in the course of it, he said to me, well, are you, are you just sick of politics? Uh, or is there, if I think that there's some way you can be helpful, uh, you might be willing. I said, I'm, I'm not sick of politics. I, I, I love public service. And I'll be very happy to do anything I can uh, to help you in any way. That was in March. And it wasn't until several months later uh, that he called me and asked if I would uh, uh, representing him in Northern Ireland, but he, in good faith, said it'll, it'll just be about six months. He wanted me to organize a conference on trade with and investment in Northern Ireland to underpin the then just beginning peace process. And so I thought, sure, it'd be a great thing to do. I, I really didn't know much about the issue in Northern Ireland. My father's parents were born in Ireland and were immigrants to the United States, but my father never knew his parents. Uh, he, they, uh, the father died, the mother couldn't care for the children. Uh, I mean, the reverse, mother died, the father couldn't care for the children. So my father and his siblings were all raised in orphanages. 
and uh, he was adopted by an elderly couple who were childless, who were not Irish. So I, I never heard him say the word Ireland. Uh, we never went anywhere, and certainly not to Ireland, so I hadn't, hadn't, didn't know much about it. I spent uh, six months organizing the conference, and on the, the night before the conference, late at night, about 11 o'clock, uh, President Clinton called me. He said, well, my staff has given me this draft speech for tomorrow at the conference. He said, and it really doesn't say very much. He said, but uh, several of them said to me that uh, People kind of liked you over there, so if I can announce that you're going to stay for another six months, he said it'll probably be helpful to me at the conference. So I'd been there a few times, and I enjoyed it, so I said, sure, uh, thinking that that would be it. But one thing led to another. So uh, I, I viewed it as uh, uh, just an opportunity to continue in a form of public service that was not nearly as demanding as being Senate Majority Leader. and. Uh, Little did I know that I would end up being there for five years. That came later. Uh, as I said, one thing led to another quite unexpectedly. It seems to turn about fair play to some extent. Um, but, I, but I do want to say about it, uh, when I get into the process over there, I realized that the best training I'd had for dealing with these guys had been the previous six years dealing with 99 other United States senators. After that, I was ready for anything. <laughs> So you've written a really wonderful book about the experience, and the richness of the negotiations are quite yeah. remarkable. You took about 100 flights back and forth, I'm told, over that period of time. Yeah. Can you describe a couple of the kind of critical moments you know, where you saw the whole process in some jeopardy that you were able to yeah. bring back, and you know, what enabled you to do that? Well, yes, let me describe, first of all, the first day when I made one of the most stupid statements I've ever made. I, I've made a lot of stupid statements. When you talk a lot, when you're in public office, you talk a lot, and so naturally you make a lot of mistakes and you say a lot of things you later regret. Everything's recorded and reported. So I knew that the uh, delegates in Northern Ireland, the peace talks, had been in conflict for a long time. The conflict was still raging. Although there were nominal ceasefires, there was still a great deal of violence. Indeed, while we were in negotiations, two of the delegates were assassinated. And there were, a lot of the people in the talks had themselves been involved in violent action at sort of prison terms. And so there was a, a heavy overlay of violence and, and no history of even listening to the other side. So. <laughs> not fully comprehending what I was doing, I wanted to make the point to them that I would listen to whatever they have to say, that they, 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 someone would hear them out. And so I, I said to them, I'm a product of the US Senate, where there is the rule of unlimited debate. And I've listened to 16-hour speeches, 12-hour speeches. I said, I can listen to anything you guys say. So. Nobody will ever be able to leave these talks and say they didn't have a chance to speak their piece. Little did I realize that I would sit there for years, not, not <laughs> days, months, years, listening to the same people making the same statements over and over again. And how often I regretted having made that, uh, that statement. But it actually served me well in the end. And the second anecdote on the first day, one of the delegates, a fellow who was a great man, he was a leader of a political party that was affiliated with paramilitaries, and he himself had served a lengthy prison term for attempted bombing and attempted murder. Uh, he, he said to me in a loud voice, maybe big table, about 60 people and microphones and everything, he said, Senator, if there's uh, if you're to be of any use to us, there's one thing you must understand from the outset. And I said, what is it? He said, we in Northern Ireland would drive 100 miles out of our way to receive an insult. <laughs> they all got chip on their shoulders. So that, that uh, induced the caution in me. But uh, the other uh, experience I'll relate is uh, when we got to the very end. It, 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 after 18 months, just before Christmas of 1997, I held a small meeting of just the leaders. No, no microphones, no recording, no note takers, just the leaders, to try to get them to agree on a statement of the issues that we would have to address. 
not the answers, just agreeing on what were the issues. This is after 18 months, and they couldn't agree. The meeting degenerated into terrible acrimony and shouting and insults and so forth. So I left to fly home very, very depressed for Christmas. On December 27th, two days after Christmas, one of the most prominent uh, unionist paramilitary leaders was murdered in prison by a group of nationalist or Catholic prisoners. That touched off a series of retaliatory assassinations. Every day, one or two people were killed both sides. And if, if you woke up in the morning and you got a news report that a Protestant had been killed, you're absolutely certain that sometime that afternoon a Catholic would be killed. Back and forth they went. The governments were desperate, the British and Irish government, so they moved the negotiations in January of the next year to London from Northern Ireland. It was worse than ever, and then in February they moved to Dublin, and it was still worse. Parties had to be expelled because of violence. The violence was accelerating. And so on the flight home from uh, Dublin to New York, I, I decided that we had to try something radical, which was an absolute unbreakable deadline early to try to stop the decline, the spiraling decline into violence that I thought would soon engulf the talks. And uh, they agreed, and we set a deadline. It was April 10th of 1998. That's the 20th year anniversary this year. And for the first time, I felt that uh, there was a chance. Uh, and we had the last two weeks of pretty much round-the-clock negotiations. The two prime ministers of the UK and Ireland came. President Clinton was on the phone all night uh, the last night open line to the White House to try to encourage people. And uh, we finally were able to uh, bring it to a successful conclusion. But it was a very close run thing. It, it could have easily have gone, gone the other way. And I, and I do want to make this point in a setting that we're talking about politicians and politics. It's pretty widespread now, particularly in Western democracies, to ridicule, demean, hold in low regard elected officials, and God knows much of that is deserved. But I don't think we who live in democracies pay enough attention and tribute to the occasions when men and women do rise to the occasion. And in Northern Ireland, these were ordinary men and women, many of them would be the equivalent in our country of state legislators. They had been in conflict all of their lives. Many of them had been engaged in violence. Several of them had been shot and shot at. And yet, at enormous risk to themselves, to their families, to their careers, they rose to the occasion and reached an agreement that has resulted in 20 years of peace, a long way from solving all the problems. Uh, and they persist to this day. There are very serious issues still pending, but they're trying to resolve them through peaceful and democratic means, through debate, discussion, not through bullets and bombs. And so I, I, I think that at a time of turmoil in most democracies, including our own, you know, when I went to Northern Ireland April 10th, when I got off the plane, there's a bunch of television cameras and crews there, and the first question the guy asked me was, well, isn't this terrible, all this political dysfunction in Northern Ireland? And I said, well, listen, I just got off the plane from the United States. <laughs> I, I don't feel I'm in a position to lecture anybody on political dysfunction. Uh, the fact is, it's epidemic through the, throughout the Western world. In all of the democracies, we're going through a period of difficult transition. And there is a lot of unrest. There is a lot of uncertainty. There is, is a lot of fear. What we have to do is to try as best we can to stick with the institutions, to strengthen our democratic institutions, to make sure that whatever our differences, they're resolved peacefully. And that, I think, is what the people of Northern Ireland have found. So I kind of probe that a little more. Um, the success grew out of the efforts that you led, but the ability of a former senator from the United States of America to go over to a foreign country and have that kind of impact clearly also flows from America's role in the world. Senator McCain, who we're thinking about a lot, um, commented that America's greatness is not just its power, but also its purpose. Right. 
And so there's been a long-standing imagination about the indispensable nation. But through exhaustion in foreign deployments, the cultural and economic alienation we've discussed, um, the kind of you know, America first idea that the current president is pressing for a more kind of insular imagination of our role in the world has gained a lot of traction. Yeah. How do you see those two um, interests reconciling? Well, the United States is the dominant world power. Uh, we have by far the largest economy in the world. We have by far the greatest military force ever assembled. Uh, but most importantly, we have the ideals that have and continue to inspire people all around the world. No American should ever forget that the United States was a great nation long before we were a great economic or military power. The United States became a great nation on the day that the Constitution was adopted. And we accepted as our national ideals those principles that have now become universal. We take it all for granted, but it was radical at the time. And it is that which appeals to people all over the world. We, we are a nation of immigrants. Uh, just today's New York Times, there's a front page report that we have a very large proportion of Americans who were born outside the country. Have you ever met someone who came to this country and said, I came because you have the best cruise missiles? You've never met one. They came here, like my father's parents, like my mother, an immigrant and so, because they saw in America freedom and opportunity. It's difficult to summarize our principles, but surely they include, first, of course, the sovereignty of the people, individual liberty, our highest priority, an independent judicial system, the rule of law applied equally to all citizens and crucially to the government itself, up to and including the highest leaders. And finally, although not explicitly written into the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, opportunity for everyone. The notion that anyone in America with talent and a willingness to work and drive can rise to the highest level. That's what appeals to people all around the world. And it is, it is to that which we must look for the strength and inspiration to move us forward despite the current difficulties. And I believe that we will. I think our institutions are strong. The difficulties that we are having are not unique to our country or to our time. In every period of rapid transition, there is disorientation, fear, among the public. You can go all the way back to the Greek city-states five, six, seven hundred years before the birth of Christ, when they went through a transition from dictatorship to oligarchy to what we call democracy. That's where the word comes from. It's a combination of two Greek words, demos the people, kratzi the rule of. And interestingly, if you read the history of that period, you find many, many statements that are almost identical to statements made today about fear of loss of cultural values. We want it to be the way it was. We, don't, we want our way of life to remain as was. The threat then was democracy. The notion that ordinary citizens should have a say in their governance was one of the, considered to be a radical notion, disruptive, and that's why people feared change, and they still do. And now we're going through a tremendous transition. The Industrial Revolution began 250 years ago in England. Machines were invented to replace men in the production of goods. And there was then widespread fear of massive unemployment. So there was upheaval, there was violence, there was resistance, there was change. But in the course of that 100 years, New goods, new products, new services, new jobs lifted the economy for the entire society. And we're going through a, a, a period of transition that I think will be seen by historians as significant a turning point in human history, as was the Industrial Revolution, a combination of technological change, increase, increases in global trade, 
and dramatic increases in the movement of people across national borders. It's very disorienting for people, and so they're afraid. And when you're afraid, you tend to look back, usually through rose-colored glasses. I always like to read these people saying, oh, I want it the way it was 50 or 100 years ago. Well, you might want, you might want it, but not if you're an African-American, not if you're a minority, not if you were uh, poor, I mean, it, it may look great, the past may look great to some, but for vast millions of Americans, the past wasn't so very good. And the fact is, we're a much better country than we have were in the past. Just think about it. When the Constitution was adopted, great as it was, the men who wrote it were the products of their time. It condoned slavery. It included the contemplation of slavery by providing that African Americans would count for three-fifths of a vote, less than fully human. It took 70, 75 years in the bloodiest war in history to end slavery. It wasn't for another 70 years that women got the right to vote. How unthinkable is that, that for 120 years after we were a nation, women couldn't vote? And it wasn't until some of us were in the Senate that we passed the Americans with Disabilities Act, led by Bob Dole yep. and Tom Harkin, to give disabled people for the first time in American history the right to live full and meaningful lives. Uh, so the changes, the changes have been constant as our definition of human rights and civil rights has expanded to meet changing times. So I would argue the United States, out of all of these crises, is a much bigger, more diverse, stronger, better country than in the past. And what we have to do is to keep moving forward in a way that doesn't forget those or leave behind those who lack the skills to compete in the 21st century, but find a way not to try to recreate for them a past that never was, but to help them create a better future for themselves and everybody else. Senator, that was um, one of the more consequential expressions of optimism that we've heard in a while. And we were going to run it on a continuous loop in the back room, because <laughs> it's tough out there for some of the BPC staff. Um, I want to ask you a couple questions about kind of leadership traits, and then we're going to, we're going to open it up. Um, and the first is about humor. So you have a lot of gravitas. I mean, we were used to joke when we were doing that project together about yeah. Bangladesh that you could read the back of a cereal box and people would right. stand there in rapt yeah. attention. Um, but you're also a pretty funny guy. Um, great leaders. Not Dole, compared to Bob Dole. Al Simpson, <laughs> McCain, yeah. and Glickman. I mean, even the North Dakotans that work with BPC <laughs> actually can tell a decent Garrison Keillor joke from time yeah. to time. Um, and that's saying something. Um, it seems like humor actually is an important leadership trait. And I wanted to ask you to reflect on that. And are there other just kind of individual quirks or capacities that you think are? Uh, well, the first and most important thing is you have to be able to laugh at yourself. Uh, we're all human. Uh, every human is fallible. Every human makes mistakes almost every day. Every human institution makes mistakes. And so if you take yourself too seriously, which is a, an occupational hazard. I, I, this is a digression. Some of you are old enough to remember when Mao Zedong was the uh, supreme ruler in China. And before he left, passed away, he, he published a book. The Sayings of Chairman Mao it was a small red leather covered book. And before I pass away, I'm going to do a little blue leather covered book <laughs> called The Sayings of Senator Mitchell. Saying number one. There is no limit to the human capacity for rationalization. And boy, are we seeing that now in our country. People can rationalize just about anything uh, if they put their mind to it. The second one is, the higher up one goes in political life, the greater the capacity for self-delusion, culminating in the White House, where the capacity for self-delusion is the greatest, not just the current incumbent, but every president is subject to it. Finding people who will internally tell you, no, you can't do that. You've got to do this. That's, that's wrong. That's very, very, very tough to do. So in all of it, you have to understand that you're going to make a certain number of mistakes. I'll tell you when I, when I first when this first struck me, 
I, I served as United States Attorney, and I practiced law for a long time before I became a federal judge. So I tried many cases in court. I thought I was prepared to reverse my role and become a judge presiding over trials, but I'll never forget the first trial I ever presided over. First thing I did is I, I wanted to make sure I didn't trip on my robe walking up the stairs and fall down and make a fool of myself. I got up the stairs. Then I sat there. And the first time a lawyer said, after the other asked the question, objection, I realized I had to make a decision in one second. You don't, you, you don't sit there and ponder it. Objection. Overruled or sustained. This went on all day, and I'm, I'm starting to think to myself, do I know what I'm doing? And that night, I had a hard time sleeping. I, said, I'm, I'm, I have to make these snap decisions for the first time in my life, and it's very difficult. And then I realized, you're a human being. You're going to make a certain number of mistakes. Maybe you're right 60, 70, 80 percent of the time. You've got to live with that and move on. And to do that, you have to develop the capacity to laugh at yourself. And if you can laugh at yourself, you can make others laugh. And I think it is an important trait of leadership. So my last um, question is that while it's very difficult to predict the election, we will, with some certainty, wake up on Wednesday the 7th with a closely divided government. And with all likelihood, um, Mitch McConnell and uh, Chuck Schumer will be leading the Senate. You have always been cautious about providing public advice to your successors. Um, but at this moment of such national division, you know, what, what would you do if you, know, you were still the majority leader on Wednesday the 7th? I mean, what, what do you feel like is the best way for leaders in today's circumstance to capture the interests yeah. of the country? Well, I think it's still the same way that I did with Bob Dolan. Tom did it with Trent Lott. Tom, where's Tom? Tom. Sitting over here. Tom did it with Trent Lott. And it really isn't rocket science. This is a very large country. We have 325 million people. By the year 2050, there will be 440 million Americans. We people have come here from every part of the world every part of the world. The, the story this morning reported that the most rapid growth, which I was surprised at, I guess most Americans are, is not people from Latin America, but from Asia. And that they're coming with higher levels of college-educated people than exist in the native population to which they're coming. Uh, and we're going to continue to change, and we're going to continue to receive people from all around the world. So the notion that any one group or political party or ideology can have its way 100% all the time is simply not feasible in such a large, diverse country. Different histories, different regions, different races, different languages. We're citizens because of an ideal. It is your commitment to the ideals set forth in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence that make you Americans, not your race, not your religion, not your heritage. And as a result, you have to be prepared to accept principled compromise. And, and F.D. de Klerk said when he was asked what the toughest part of his negotiations were with Nelson Mandela. And he said, well, actually, the toughest part was after I reached agreement with Mandela, and then I went back to my party, and I said, we have an agreement. It's a very good agreement for our country, but it's not 100% of what we wanted. That's the toughest part. And, and Tom will tell you from dealing, that's true in the Congress as well. You, I negotiated with Bob Dole every day, and I go back to the Democratic caucus. There was always someone who felt, well, you could have done better. You should have got this. You should have got that. Uh, you have to accept the notion that some compromise is essential for the continued function of government in a large, diverse society. And the second is to accept the notion that no one has a monopoly on knowledge, wisdom, or the right course of action. And you have to constantly ask yourself, 
am I doing the right thing? You have to force yourself to listen to the other side. Even though you might not like the person, you might not like the party, you might not like the ideology, with an attitude, he may be right. And I may learn something listening to him, and maybe he's got a point. At least you have to, in good faith, listen to contrary arguments. That, I think, are the, the, the essential elements of leadership in a democratic society. They may not be the essential elements of leadership in a totalitarian society. But in a democracy, there has to be that understanding of the context in which we operate in this truly great country, which I believe still remains the most open, free, and just society in all of human history, despite our many failures and imperfections. And finally, I make one point. As good as you think you are as a leader, keep in mind that some of the best men in our country's history made some of the worst decisions in our country's history. That's interesting. Franklin Roosevelt authorized the detention of Japanese Americans. Franklin Roosevelt authorized the turning back of the ship St. Louis that was filled with Jew Jews fleeing Nazism. And the ship went back to Europe, and a large number of those on the ship died in the Holocaust. He still was a great man, but he's a human being, and he made mistakes. And so we are all human. We are all fallible. Every leader must have a sense of his own fallibility and the consequences of acting wrongly. And I think if you combine those attributes, you're going to get pretty good leadership. You're going to have some more humility in government, I would hope, in the next few years. We have about 10 minutes for questions. We have some fleet-footed mic runners. Um, please uh, let us know who you are, and just wait one moment for the microphone. I, I can speak loud enough. My name's Frank, and I've, I've worked in low-income housing my entire life. Uh, Frank, will you grab the microphone just oh, for the sure. people in the corner? It's right next to you. Right there. Okay. There you go. Uh, good friends with Chuck Etson, and I think Chuck worked with you and Senator Dole on a really good bipartisan program called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. Uh, I just don't see those kind of things happening now, and I'd like you to maybe talk about local level. I've worked in rural Appalachia. I worked in the inner city with all kinds of people, and poverty is race indifferent. Uh, you know, as a lifelong Democrat, I feel we really need to talk about personal responsibility and how can our party, and I know this is bipartisan, but yeah. how can our party talk about personal responsibility without offending the people we're serving? Thank you. Well, first, I, I believe we can and should talk about personal responsibility because it's an essential <laughs> element in an effectively functioning democracy. A democracy imposes a much larger burden on its citizens than do other and primarily totalitarian forms of government. It requires a citizenry that's <coughs> participating in a sense of being aware of what's going on, casting informed votes, contributing to hopefully uh, informed debate. So I, I, I don't see any reason why Democrats cannot and should not talk about the importance of responsibility because it's an, important, it's an important factor in politics. And politics is really not separate from the rest of our lives. It's an integral part of our lives, like everything else. I want to say something about the low-income tax credit. Another attribute of leadership is to recognize when people recognize there are circumstances in which people deserve credit. The low income housing tax credit was principally written by a person you've never met or heard of. But very fortunately for you and the others, he's sitting right over here. Bobby Rosen, where's Bobby? Stand up, Bobby. Stand up, stand up. <laughs> yeah. he, he was on my staff. He saw the need. He came to me, persuaded me of the wisdom of what he was proposing, wrote, basically wrote the legislation and helped push it through. Uh, and uh, a good example of collaboration uh, uh, through Bobby's efforts, uh, Senator John Danforth of Missouri, a Republican, joined us in our efforts. It was a very difficult thing to do uh, because there was considerable opposition to it initially. But we were able finally to get it enacted, and it served our country very well. Uh, 
uh, and uh, thanks to Bobby and his uh, leadership. It's about the only tool we have left for Florida. It is, right, tool. it is. And it, it's, a, it's a critical issue uh, all across the country, uh, absolutely critical. We have a question here in the middle. Good afternoon. My name is Beatrice Wynn. Thank you for your time, Senator Mitchell. I work for the Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. And my question is regarding the role of universities, higher education, in teaching these principles, that's the way that you say it, without compromise, democracy is really in jeopardy. Yeah. Not only in the US, but around the world. I am an immigrant from Mexico, and I see that. So I would love to hear your thoughts about what do universities we need to do in the classroom to really teach the willingness to compromise for the future leaders of this country and the world. Right. Thank you. Well, I think among the reasons why we're very fortunate is that uh, by almost every measurement, uh, uh, American universities are, are leaders in their fields uh, throughout the world. I think nine of the 10 top rated universities in the world are American universities. And of course, we have literally hundreds of other universities that maybe don't reach the top nine out of 10, but uh, are making an enormous contribution to our society. When Franklin Roosevelt signed into law the GI Bill of Rights, only 4% of adult Americans had college educations. It's a very recent phenomenon in our history that very large numbers, very large portions of the population are college educated, triggered by that act. And, and a series of following acts led by Senator Pell and many others. We've now made college education accessible to larger numbers, and I believe it's now around over 30% of Americans have college degrees. But of course, the degree is symbolic. It's, it's, it represents knowledge, but it is not in itself knowledge. And it's critically important that I think that we stress in our education efforts, and really, I don't think it has. I don't think it should wait for college. It ought to be more at the uh, elementary and secondary level. Uh, the importance in a large, pluralistic, democratic society of uh, getting along with people. Many have said that one of the major factors in American success was that we are the first national society to require elementary education for all as opposed to an elite smaller number and now we've moved on to college education as well. So I, I, I hope it's stressed. I know obviously you can't control the curricula of uh, universities but it seems to be in their self-interest but I think also in our public school systems which are all local controlled of course that we, we place greater emphasis on it. And I, and I, I, I do want to make a Comment. I'll save it for the conclusion about the immigrant situation. You know, okay. with we have time respect for to a final question and then your conclusion. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. My name is Scott. As I told Senator Daschle, 50 years ago next year, I came to work as a page in the Senate for four years. So my question is: Any observations you'd care to make on the on the operations of the Senate or of government in general among the time when you came, when you left, and now? Yes. I think it's much more difficult now. Uh, I thought it was hard then. I'm sure Tom did when he was there. But I think uh, a variety of uh, factors, political, cultural, social, have contributed to the uh, uh, difficulties in the Senate and the House and in effective functioning. Uh, I'll mention just two. I'm not a historian or a sociologist, but two of which out of my own experience in politics suggest have to change before we can uh, improve the situation. Although I think, in, it, to put it in context, there never was a time in American history when politics was all sweetness and light. Uh, a professor at the University of Maine published a lengthy article a while ago on the presidential campaign of 1800, when the candidates were men, two men who are now national icons, John Adams and Jefferson. And some of the things written about them by their uh, by their supporters about the opposition were much more harsh than what anybody says. Uh, 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 Jefferson supporters labeled John Adams as a hermaphrodite. They said he lacked the strength of a man or the gentleness of a woman. <laughs> and uh, Adams' supporters uh, uh, accused Jefferson of spreading uh, murder, rape, 
and uh, incest all over the land. So it's very rough stuff. But of course, they didn't have electronic communications. There wasn't a te three television sets in every home. And the, the words were written and not read by many, so it didn't have the effect of today. Two things I think are two prerequisites to meaningful change, not by themselves, but are important first steps, would be uh, to uh, reduce partisanship and gerrymandering. Much has been written about that. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, simply outrageous after the 2010 reapportionment that uh, in several states, Republican candidates won less than 50% of the vote and won two-thirds of the seats. Democrats participated in the same effort prior to that, but in 10 years, tech, that's a lifetime in technology, so as technology advances, the ability to redraw congressional districts with mathematical precision accelerates and partisanship gets worse. We have to reverse that and have what I hope will be as close as possible to nonpartisan redistricting as we can. Uh, the second is money. Uh, our, our, our democracy is drowning in a sea of money. Uh, it's always been that way. Money and organization have played a role in leadership from the dawn of civilization. But in our society, it is especially acute now, the combination of two factors. The decision in the Citizens United case by the Supreme Court and a series of related decisions, it wasn't just one decision, have essentially made it not possible for the Congress to limit either contributions to campaigns or expenditures by campaigns. And then secondly, the steep decline in transparency. It's an enormous irony that those who defend opening the floodgates to money make the argument that sunshine is the best disinfectant. Anybody should be able to give what they want as long as it becomes public. Well, right now, anybody is giving what they want, and it's less public than ever because of a series of related decisions, not court actions. Transparency has essentially disappeared, and there's not a person in this room, there's not a person in this country who can tell you all of the money that's going on and who's giving what to whom. And I, I think it's destructive of the process. I, I urge everybody here and everybody who hears this to pull up a, a segment by 60 Minutes in, in the spring of 2000, I believe it was 16, maybe 17, a, a former Republican congressman from Tampa, Florida named David Jolly. I've never met him, but he did a long interview in which he described the process of orientation that he received in his first week in Congress. And it was literally all about money. And he was given a card that a sample day, four and a half hours raising money, one hour with constituents, one hour on legislation. And that's what it is. And to be fair, both parties do the same thing in their orientation programs. And they even showed pictures of the phone booths that they go where they, uh, where they make the calls. I, I think that's got to change. Uh, we're, 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 I, I'll ask a question here I ask all over the country. Congressmen here can't answer. Uh, who thinks that members of Congress are more responsive to their constituents than they are to their donors? I've asked that question for 10 years. Audiences all over America. And only a couple of hands been raised, and I want to tell you. No, you get your hand half up. The first, the first person that ever put her hand up like this was just outside of Washington here a few years ago. And it was one woman. And I didn't say anything in the program. But afterward, I, I walked up to her and I said, look, I said, I don't want to embarrass you in front of the whole crowd, but I'm really curious. And you're the only woman in America, the only person in America who's ever raised your hand when I asked that question. <laughs> So I want to ask you why. She said, oh, it's very simple. My husband's a member of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> Senator, um, make, proving my point about humor. A uh, couple last thoughts? No, I'll conclude as I began uh, on two subjects, Bob Doe and Liddy Doe and the Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, it was a great honor for me to serve with Bob to know him as a friend, and really as a mentor and a hero. I, I, when I first met him, I was somewhat in awe of him. Uh, still I am. Uh, and I think it's a great thing that you're doing. 
to name this uh, series for him. And secondly, uh, to the Bipartisan Policy Center for doing what you are doing in, I would say, the most difficult of circumstances to try to encourage bipartisan action uh, when it's uh, uh, receding throughout our national level. But I think it's a time when a place like the BPC, BPC is needed most. So I'm pleased to have been one of the founders with Tom and Bob and Howard Baker. And uh, I hope everyone listening will understand and support the work of the center to keep alive the hope of bipartisanship in the difficult period through which our country is going. Well, Senator, we could not have asked for a, a better introduction to this series. I really appreciate you spending the afternoon. Thank you, Jason.